Hello, everyone. Welcome to another live recording of Dragon Talk here on the Dungeons & Dragons Twitch channel. I am Greg Tito. I am joined by Mr. Matt Cernet. Hello. He is going to uh, uh, endure me running through some of the fun things that are going through Dungeons & Dragons and touched by Dungeons & Dragons and in which Dungeons & Dragons touches us. Mr. Perkins is also joining us, but uh, uh, we are going forward with talking about fun announcements. How are you guys doing on this fine Monday? Um, I see you all in the chat jumping around. Uh, we had some uh, Chipotle being eaten here in the thing. You can go ahead and take a seat. It's all good. Um, and uh, we're going to talk today on lore uh, with these guys about uh, Vecna, everyone's favorite villain uh, from a recent web series uh, concluded just very recently. Uh, we're, of course, we're talking about Critical Role. Um, and then we will also, so we'll talk about like the Dungeons & Dragons uh, lore behind Vecna, not necessarily the, the Tal'Dorei version of that uh, 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 character. Um, although it does inform both. Um, then we're also going to talk about Dragonborn uh, this year time. I don't think we've ever really gone into a lot about the lore behind Dragonborn, cool. so I'm excited to get into that. Uh, but that's coming up in just a couple minutes, uh, and uh, we are going to talk uh, about all the fun stuff. Uh, Chris is looking at one of the awesome things. <laughs> Gale Force 9 has our Tomb of Annihilation Dungeon Master screen. It should be out oh. in stores now. It's uh, got all of the art uh, we made for the marketing of that adventure. So it's got the Port Nye and Zaru uh, uh, image, which is one of my favorites, as well as Raz Nisi, uh, the of course, the Tomb of Annihilation uh, uh, Green Devil face, as well as... Uh, gosh, yeah, that... Uh, I, I, and more art on the inside. More yeah, art on the beautiful. inside, true. And the inside also has random encounters that you can encounter in Schultz. Tables uh, galore. Tables galore. My favorite might be the uh, uh, random encounters in Port Nye and Zaru. Uh, and the result number one is a parrot oh. poops on you. Yes, yes. Dehydration. <laughs> yeah. Dehydration. How do, you, how do you tell <laughs> folks about dehydration? Yeah. Uh, it's good I'm stuff. I'm feeling a little dehydration right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dang it. Well, you can go get some water if you want. I didn't realize that's what you were I hanging I would rather with. roll on the random table, but we don't have any dice here. This I is know. You know who Nathan Stewart took our, uh, uh, our all of our D20s for some, for some nefarious plan of his, right. uh, which was terrible. Uh, but we have some more somewhere around here. Uh, but yes, of course, you can use the Dungeon Master screen in conjunction with playing Tomb of Annihilation, which is out in stores now everywhere. Uh, we've been talking about it uh, and uh, getting into the lore behind it for a lot of things. But there are also people playing it in the Dungeons & Dragons Twitch channel all week long. Uh, so tonight we have Force Grey. I think we're doing episode 12 uh, tonight. Uh, it is, let me just double check that because I actually have it here. Uh, it is episode 12, that's right, and it is 50 minutes, five zero minutes, very long, uh, it is good stuff, and then, uh, uh, we'll be doing at least two episodes uh, going forward for the next uh, few weeks uh, with more and more content coming from Force Grey as they get closer and closer to the tomb itself. Um, at 8 p.m. Pacific time tonight, Rachel Seeley and Erica Fermini are going to be playing Neverwinter. They are in the Neverwinter channel uh, playing through uh, their characters. They've been playing for a couple of weeks now, so I'm assuming they're in the teens. They will be getting up to uh, much more farther along and uh, uh, getting into some of the Tomb of Annihilation content uh, after some time. But they are awesome. They're from Girls Guts Glory. If you don't know Rachel and Erica, uh, they were streaming yesterday on the here Twitch channel. They do Sundays at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, they have a new Dungeon Master. That's Kelly D'Angelo. And uh, Kellen Coleman is also joining that cast. Uh, there was some Twitch uh, tomfoolery going on with the servers, let's say. Twitch glitch? A Twitch glitch happened. It's true. Yeah, they got, uh, they got, they got the snitch, the golden snitch for the Twitch glitch. Uh, gosh, I wish there was do done Dr. Seuss, <laughs> Seussical the musical things going on. Um, but yeah, it's fun stuff, uh, and uh, they'll be going. Does anybody know if that actually happens on Sundays, like regularly? Like there's a Twitch glitch on Sundays. It just seemed to happen the last few weeks. Uh, those guys have been subjected to uh, 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 more school absences. Uh, Tuesday, tomorrow, we got Dragon Plus. Uh, they are going to be talking about the Tomb of Annihilation Tales from Candlekeep game. Uh, we're, I'm talking to Frederick Temblay at uh, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time today. Uh, but then tomorrow, Chris Dupuy is going to be on talking to Bart Carroll uh, about that game as well. So Deep Dive actually showing the actual board game as it is uh, being played. That's pretty exciting. I'll be back here at 3.30 for uh, uh, Dungeons & Dragons news. And then we'll be throwing it not to Chris uh, because there is no dice camera action right. episode today. Uh, they are going to tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. Yeah. They're going to be filming something special, though. I think. Uh, well, we're going to be doing something. I don't know if it's going to be live or not. 
I don't think we're going to do a well, Yeah, let's not do a Well, maybe we, we can do to, a live. I think we have to edit it. Yeah. Yeah, we have to talk about that. Yeah. How it's all going to work. But it's going to be very fun and it involves puppets. Can I say that? I uh, know. Dang it. All right. Well, I, I, retract, <laughs> I retract that comment. It has to do with socks. <laughs> it's all about socks. <laughs> Uh, but you guys are gearing up for TwitchCon. That's right. uh, the yep. performance of that is at 11 a.m. on Sunday? 11 a.m. on Sunday, correct. And it will be live streamed for those who aren't at the show. That's right. And we will be hosting it here, uh, but it will be live streamed from the, from the official Twitch That's channels, right. right? And we'll have a couple guest stars. That's, do you want to go into who those are real quick? Uh, no. Oh, you're like abound with secrets today. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so yeah, no dice camera action tomorrow, but then we will be having the, uh, I believe the first episode of Maze Arcana Sirens of the Realms, which is an all girl bard band traveling through the, uh, you know, the very populated areas of Chult. That's a cool idea. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, so Seems like a wrong place for a bard band to end I, up, but I, you know. That's what I was going with. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, you don't really want to tour, you know, the Amazon, but, you know, here they are yeah. doing that. Uh, Satine Phoenix is going to be the dungeon master there, and uh, Vivid Vika, Amy Vorpal, Maud Garrett, and Kate Elliott. So I'm excited Seems about Seems like they took a wrong turn at Scornoobal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And ended up in the wrong place. Yeah. Uh, but I'm excited to see how they get out. Uh, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, Mark Holmes uh, with the rest of the High Rollers crew is doing Dead Reckoning. They're playing evilish characters, uh, different from Uncharted Territory, but uh, more of a prequel to that storyline. Uh, so that stars uh, Katie Morrison, Chris Trott, Kim Richards, and Tom Hazel. Very excited about uh, uh, where that has been going. And then One Grung Above at 2 p.m. on Wednesdays, DM Chris Lindsay, Satine Phoenix, Rudy Runeberg, Lauren Urban, and Sig Neutron are all grungs. They are uh, very evil frog people, but I think their characters may be also evilish. They're getting better at it. Uh, uh, each of them are a different color. They have a cast system that's arranged by what color the, fro the tree frog is. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting. Uh, and uh, Lauren Urban, who is in that, is also the dungeon master for Destiny and Doom with Jack and Mika from Rooster Teeth and Friends. And that is on 3 p.m. on Thursdays, uh, which uh, has Lauren, uh, Mika Burton, Dante Bosco, Cricken, and Jack Patillo in that, which is very exciting. Um We'll be hosting uh, the C team and not Critical Role probably on that Thursday, right? Next Thursday? Are they they're not? They're not. I'm not sure. I don't think. I, I think th they're taking they a might, bit of a break, right? Yeah. Well, they're gonna before the new show starts up. They're gonna be doing various and sundry other games. Ah. So it could be they're doing something. Various and sundry. Not the, on not, the, and sundry. Yeah, not the regular campaign, no. Right. Uh, I can't wait to see where they where where, where Matt goes next. Yeah. Well, he's going to the altar next. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Uh, and then the next adventure after that. I mean, that's, that's an adventure unto itself. Yeah. But who knows where uh, uh, the Vox Machina uh, They'll be going into the future. Going. Back to the future? Possibly. <laughs> Uh, exciting. Uh, Fridays, we've got uh, Roll20 Presents, uh, Tomb of Annihilation. So Adam Koble and Distracted Elf, Andrew Gillis, Dave the Human, and Blue Jay are all doing that at 2 p.m. Pacific time on Friday. And Tales from Candlekeep, uh, Sophie and Fred will be playing through more Tomb of Annihilation uh, storyline there uh, in addition to us doing it on Dragon Plus uh, tomorrow. They're going to be doing that pretty much every week on Fridays. Uh, Saturday and Sunday also have tons of Dungeons & Dragons shows going on. Encounter Roleplay, Learn by Play. I'm talking to Will Jones and Sid Shields uh, today, actually, in the next hour, we'll be calling them up on the Skypes in 45 minutes, in fact. Uh, Shelly and I will be talking to them. I can't wait to, to pick their brains. They did the podcast of Annihilation uh, just a few weeks ago, and they've been doing this great learn-by-play show uh, in which Will has been stopping the action uh, in the middle of, of Dungeon Mastering and, and talking to the audience in his little soundproof booth about mm -hmm. what the uh, decisions that he made and things like that. So I think it's a great way for Dungeon Masters to learn. Uh, nice gimmick. It's pretty cool. Um, and then Heroes Graveyard is uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time with Trump and Koibu and friends. Uh, they have bring in a whole new audience as Trump is a more of a, a Hearthstone um, video game Twitch uh, player. Uh, so they are getting exposed to Dungeons and & Dragons, and uh, I love their, their analytic, more tactical feel uh, to the game on that. Uh, Sunday has Maze Arcana. Uh, we'll be cutting into that a little bit uh, this Sunday for TwitchCon, uh, with, for, for your thing. Uh, but then we'll be switching it up to Maze Arcana Orphan Echo, and then Girls Guts Glory on 3 p.m. Uh, at 3 p.m. on Sunday. 
good stuff all happening there. Um, I think I mentioned some of these already uh, just through it, but uh, uh, you can always check out D&D Beyond has uh, Tomb of Annihilation content in it. They're busy working on Xanathar's Guide to Everything content. Uh, that is the next release coming from Dungeons & Dragons. It comes out November 10th. In game stores, you can get the alternate cover there, designed by Hydro 74 only in game stores. We're only making a limited number of those out there. It's pretty cool. Uh, but while you're there, you can also pick up a lot of fun stuff that is in game stores uh, uh, that I'm highlighting a little bit here. We also we talked about the Dungeon Master screen. We can also get uh, this Adventure Grid, uh, which is a newish product uh, from Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, go ahead and open it up and, right. and, and play around with it. Um, but is a dry and wet erase board, heavy duty uh, it's like uh, a game uh, board. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a, a, a a board game board. Yep. Uh, that's that level of thickness, oh, and uh, uh, it's just like a different version of having like a rollout map. Nice. Uh, uh, but it's got dungeon tiles on one side and uh, more wilderness style things. So if you're into the more tactical miniature and it's play, marker friendly. It's marker friendly, there both dry and wet erase. Well, well, well. Well, well, well. Um, versatile, and I like that you can kind of fold it up and take it places without it having those creases yeah. in it that it would be in a, in, a, in a mat. If you were to frisbee this at somebody, you could take their head off. <laughs> it's very sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it out, see what happens. <laughs> uh, and that's when Greg died uh, during the podcast. Uh, oh, and then, uh, of course... Uh, we're going to be talking to uh, Fred Tremblay about Tales from Candlekeep, but this is the Tomb of but Annihilation. Wait, more. I uh, know. The Tomb of Annihilation board. I'm not going to tip it over anymore because there will be pieces coming out. Uh, but this is what Tales from Candlekeep is based on. It's a, it's a physical board game that our friends at WizKids made, and it's in the same vein as uh, Legend of Drist, Temple of Elemental Evil, uh, Castle Ravenloft, and Wrath of, Wrath of a Shardline. This is the fifth in the adventure system. They're all compatible with one another, but you can also just play this. Uh, and what I like about this, which I don't know if a lot of people know this, but it, uh, you can do play with one player. You can go through the entire uh, <laughs> uh, thing. So a lot of people are always Jones and like, what can you do that's Dungeons right. and if Dragons you have no adjacent? Friends, if, what can you do? Well, <laughs> if you, say you're a scientist and you're at like a uh, say you're a scientist. <laughs> say you're a scientist. <laughs> I love the start Your of that. Your friends sentence. just can't come over that day. It's not that, <laughs> it, it happens. Deal. You know, things things fall out all the time. It's an imperfect world. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of people like the kind of tactical uh, uh, fun that you can have with uh, choosing which spells to do, how to uh, vanquish monsters, that kind of thing. You you can get that all in this box. Uh, there's two versions. There's can you this. play with your cat? You can also play with your cat. Okay. Yeah, because there's a tabaxi in there. So, the, of course, there the cat go. would play yeah. as, uh, uh, what's your name, Elf Song? Uh, I want to say it's Elf Song, but I could be wrong. It's uh, Bird Poop. Bird Poop. Yes, it's Bird Poop. <laughs> That's the Aarakocra. <laughs> okay. Aarakocra's name is Bird Poop. This is not cat. <laughs> uh, I wish it were. You can't play as Artist Simber, though. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Uh, and uh, Dragon Bait? Dragon Bait. Dragon Bait is also in there. We talked about uh, the Sorials uh, on a recent uh, Laurie Cheneau as well. So that's who he is. It's good stuff. Um, but, uh, again, there comes in two versions. There's the premium version, which has painted minis. Right. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but yeah. they're definitely all painted minis, so it's a good way to get, like, hey, if you need a whole bunch of Tomb of Annihilation minis, that's a, a decent way to get it. There's also the standard version, which is less expensive and has unpainted, uh, just plain plastic minis that you can paint yourself. You dun, can. Dun, dun. I can't happen. because my painting skills are shit. That, see, I bet people would love to watch you do that. <laughs> we're t- it we, would be worth a laugh. We're we talking about getting Mike Merle's uh, uh, doing his painting of miniatures in a uh, super fun hour. Mike Merle's super super happy fun hour. Can you dress him up in a mad scientist costume? Oh, I was thinking more of like a bunny costume. like Just like, <laughs> just like an Easter bunny costume. Easter bunny costume. <laughs> Over the course of an hour, that would get extremely hot. <laughs> see, this is why we, we want to torture Mike as much as possible. <laughs> I think it'll be fun. Uh, but maybe we'll get him painting some of these minis at some point, too, which would be uh, also good fun. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate as well. That is out in stores now. Uh, there is these fun promo cards uh, that you can only get, I believe, if you go into uh, or no, visit avalonhill.com promos, and you might be able to get some of these fun uh, promo cards, which are um, omens and events that are you can only get. This is the only way you can get them is, uh, is by getting them promotionally. Uh, so this one is the Death Curse, which I think is... Great. Good thing that they put that in there. I bet uh, 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 Chris Dupuy was like, oh, man, we should have put that in to begin with uh, since this is the Tomb of Annihilation thing. Mm-hmm. But then also Flash Freeze is something that can happen as well. So Betrayal of Baldur's Gate is another great way for uh, a, a board game light way to get into uh, a Dungeons & Dragons feel. Uh, you explore the city of Baldur's Gate. You put down tiles, and uh, you can vanquish monsters because something happens in the middle of the game called The Haunt, and uh, one of the players ends up being the traitor. Uh, or uh, there's some of them 
in, in, in Betrayal Baldur's Gate in which you're all you're still working uh, uh, cooperatively uh, to defeat a big bad but uh, for the most part one of the players ends up being that big bad uh, and ends up being like a fun challenge there's 50 different haunts so it's totally random what could come up uh, and it'll be a different replayable game every single time uh, especially as you explore the city all right Xanathar's got everything I mentioned that oh I didn't talk about uh, uh, extra life Extra Life is happening on mm. November 3rd. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin is going to start at Game Holcon, uh, a streamed game in which you're a player, I believe. Mike Morales is a dungeon master. I'm a DM. You're the dun- dungeon master for the Saturday night game, right? I think so, yeah. It, are, are you not playing the Friday night game? I thought you I, were. I have not been told I am. Oh, shite. All right, well, good. That, that, now you get to be a, a fun audience member for that mm. one. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be broadcasting from there as well as from this room all day on November 4th. Uh, lots of fun games happening there, I think, including uh, uh, Will Jones and Encounter Roleplay is doing a session. Uh, Chris Lindsay is uh, going to be uh, Dungeon Mastering as well as Lauren Urban. Uh, oh, actually, no, Chris Lindsay will be in, in Master. Lauren Urban will be Dungeon Mastering from here, uh, which will be tons of fun. And, uh, yeah, so as we're all raising money for Seattle Children's Hospital, we've been doing Extra Life for the last few years here at Wizards of the Coast. We love it. It's a really big, important uh, uh, part of our charitable giving. Uh, so I encourage you guys to go to our Extra Life pages. Uh, you can find that out at uh, dnd. Uh, I want to say it's at .extralife.com, but I could be completely wrong about that. Let me find it. That's why I put this on here. Oh, gosh. Where is it? I'm losing everything. Uh, I don't know. It should be right there. Well... You should go to the Dungeons and Dragons uh, website and search for Extra Life, and you'll find out information there for it. It is good stuff. Uh, another way, if you just want to get more content, is to uh, buy the Turtle package. It's all about turtles with our anthropom- anthropomorphic turtle characters. That's available on DMs Guild, D&D Beyond, and on Fantasy Grounds, and everything that we get for. Uh, that sale, uh, which is only $10, uh, goes towards our, our extra life totals. Uh, and there's been uh, thousands and thousands of dollars raised for kids already by the sale of uh, the total package. So it's pretty cool. You get the PDF. You can play it as a total. It's uh, Adventurer's League. It has also improved many campaigns with total goodness. It has, right? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I hope I hope if you have a uh, full party of turtles yeah. that they all don't die and have a turtle annihilation. Right, that would be bad. That would yeah. be bad. Yeah, um, it's super fun. It is uh, uh, Dungeons Dra- uh, D and D Adventurers League legal, uh, so you can bring your turtle character in to play uh, through the Adventurers League season that's going on now. It's good stuff. We're almost going to reach the next threshold very soon with more subclass previews from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. So please donate to us now. My page has been. You at- should have a shirt that says "Turtle Party Kill." Huh? Ah, uh, 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 we should have done that. And on the back, it can say "Turtle Shellacking." <laughs> <laughs> that joke was shellacking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh man! Uh, anyway. we, but we're gonna totally now we're spitballing here, and Emmy is gonna start furiously graphically yeah. designing these these things happening right now. Uh, you can, of course, buy uh, our extra life um, shirts. Gosh, I don't have that on here right now, but it is available. Uh, Sean, uh, I'm going to have to email you the uh, link, and you can put it in there. But you can buy Extra Life shirts uh, available right now. I think they're $25. They all go towards uh, our Extra Life total, and uh, we'll be wearing them all on November 3rd and November 4th. So if you are playing and donating and uh, uh, also raising money for kids, you can wear those shirts too. It's pretty awesome. I will get you the link as soon as I have it available. But I think for us, it's time for us to start talking about Dungeons & Dragons lore. Yay. What do you think about that? Oh, thank you, Dead in Twenty One, for subscribing for Twitch Prime. You guys are awesome. Uh, Scary Green Mountain. What, why are we killing you? Are you talking about us? Are we killing you? Uh, maybe we should do. Uh, oh, uh, oh! I'm about to introduce Matt Cernan, so you know who he is for reals. He's a lore master. That's your official title, right? Oh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Nice. They just said that you looked very uh, uh, important in the background. <laughs> just the beard. Yeah. That's, that's just, <laughs> he's the guy with the computer doing wackadoodle things. Uh, we're recording. I heard, the, I heard the beeps and the bops. Yep. Thanks, dude. Uh, all right. So we're going to do it right about now. What are we talking about first? you want to do Vecna first? Sure. All right. Let's do that. 
Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. I'm Greg Tito, and Lore You Should Know is the segment where I talk to these fantastic folks, uh, Matt Cernan. Hello. And Chris Perkins. Howdy. About fun little bits of Dungeons and Dragons lore uh, that you can use in your game that's set in the Forgotten Realms, or just use it in your game uh, anywhere. Uh, we like to, to, to encourage all kinds of play, but uh, one of those, exp- especially uh, topical right now uh, in, the, in the Dungeons and Dragons fandom universe is uh, Vecna, yes. the the character of Vecna, he's recently vanquished. Uh, spoiler mm-hmm. alert! Uh, in the uh, uh, long time series Critical Role, Matt Mercer used that character as the uh, the big bad for that entire uh, long long campaign. Uh, and we thought people might want to know more about the Dungeons and Dragons lore behind Vecna. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 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 let's get to it. Where where did Vecna first get known? Well, uh, I think Vecna, well, Vecna's in the, the Dungeon Master's Guide. The Hand of Vecna is in the Dungeon Master's Guide. It's also in Eldritch Wizardry, mm. one of the f- sort of first supplements. Um, and uh, So the artifact was what was mentioned first. Yes, and, yeah. he, and he's just a, a lich, and it's the remains of this lich. And the fact that it is this blackened hand gives uh, magical powers, um, and that you have to attach to a stump and so on. I think that's that has caught the imagination year over year over year over year, and and so gradually over time, lore has been sort of accrued to mm. that idea. It's also created apocryphal stories like the head of Vecna, yeah, which have been referenced in things like um, uh, the Planescape Torment game, mm. and uh, there's actually one is a reference to it in an actual printed adventure that we did called Die Vecna Die, where there's a head of Vecna in the the adventure because, but that was there basically after sort of the stories about the head of Vecna. It's kind of a period. because it kind of took off the idea yeah. that you had to to, to you have to cut off your hand off and put something in. Yeah, if you so there the two artifacts tied to Vecna are his eye and his hand, and they each give you magical powers. And when you have them both in your body, they give you super magical powers. And so many, many a campaign has been throttled by uh, characters chopping off their own hands and gouging out their own eyes and putting these artifacts onto themselves and then running around and obliterating everybody. Because <laughs> uh, you tend to go bad after that. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like the ultimate. Uh, uh, and then the joke is there's, that, artifact. there's this false artifact out there called the head of Vecna that basically makes characters chop off their heads. <laughs> And put well, this head on. They'll but, make them, but, but yeah, <laughs> it strongly encourages you or dupes you into doing it. And it turns out it doesn't do anything. So a lot of characters have decapitated themselves, thinking they're going to get super awesome head powers, and then realize, nope. Oh my gosh, that is the evilest dungeon master yeah. uh, uh, a trick in the book. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Uh, so why do you think that captures so much of that uh, uh, attention and wanting to put more lore into it? I think part of it is because uh, liches are cool. And Vecna was one of the first kind of named ones. Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, people sort of grokked onto that. It's just a cool sounding name. Um, now later, in later editions, uh, and, and it also bears knowing that Vecna sort of came up in Greyhawk first and then mm-hmm. got sort of co-opted and generalized and became a multiversal godlike figure when he ascended Yeah. after Die Vecna Die. Yeah, so there's there's um what, wait, what year was Die Vecna Die? Oh gosh, the 90s. Uh, that would have been right before uh, the launch of third edition, so like 98, 99. Oh, yeah. oh okay, so that was actually quite later in the cycle. Than yeah, I it was course. after the TSR buyout by Wizards. Interesting. And and that actually put Vecna and Kaz, uh, uh, in which we should mention as well. Um, so there's there's Kaz the Destroyer or, or Kaz the Hateful or Kaz the I mean, however, they, both of them have a lot of names. Yeah, Vecna's also known as like the Lord of the Spider Throne yeah. and the the Whispered One. Yep. But uh, Kos was Vecna's fighter buddy, his lieutenant. Oh, okay. and Kos was also a very bad man and super, super evil. Super, super evil, and but had a magnificent evil sword. Mm. And they got into a bit of a fracas. Kos chopped off Vecna's hand, gouged out his eye with the sword. 
uh, and um, destroyed himself in the process. Yeah. Destroyed Cass in the process? Cass kind of blew himself up in the process. It's a little wiggy at that point. We're talking high fantasy drama, super throwdown. Nobody survives at the end, but everybody seems to survive at the end, kind of apocalypse. (laughs) It's very Uh, strange. And then, uh, but Cass becomes, as Vecna becomes separated from his body parts, Cass becomes separated from his sword. Mm. So you can find the sword of Cass, another very powerful artifact item, loitering around in the worlds of D&D for years and years and years and years and years. Yeah. Interesting. And both of them sort of over the years as various authors kind of um, latched onto them, accrued other things associated with them. So there's like a mask of Koss because well, let's give him more objects than you can find. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, up to the point of like even I think there's in a... The cod piece of Koss. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, we joke, but like there's... The soiled underpants of Koss. There's, there's a, like late drag an issue like one of the last dragon issues has I think the left ear of Vecna or something like that what? yeah That's so stupid. it gets it gets was silly it, was it pierced yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the one of the funny things about it is like if you go to to Wikipedia and you read the entry on Vecna it prevents it presents this sort of very uh, like comprehensible story of this character and, and the publishing history and all this kind of stuff. It's nothing like that in reality. Like there's all kinds of stuff in there that are unverified facts and mm. unattributed things. And it's like someone had a great idea for what should be the right story and wrote it down and put it on the Wikipedia entry. And you, you should read it because it's a good story. But it's nothing <laughs> like <laughs> you got to get that guy <laughs> or that girl <laughs> in and write that story for us. Uh, oh, because so that's it. So it's basically like become like a, a, a collage of, of different details from from adventures and, and source books that kind yeah, of come definitely. together to, yeah. to what the character and, actually was. And sort of the, the fourth edition um, interpretation of Vecna was very much as, and in part because it was 3.5 and so on and so forth, but it was, Vecna is a deity, it's one of the main deities that you see in the player's handbook, and he's the god of secrets, and yeah. da, yada yada yada. Yeah. So it wasn't really until fourth edition that Vecna came to be known as a god and part of a pantheon of gods. Um, up to that point, he was still technically either mortal or dead. Yeah. How did he ascend? Well, the the die 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 adventure I think is the last in the series and one of the earlier ones. He tries to ascend and like it's all about him trying to attain super godhood where he's the only god that exists and yada yada. Um, but it's it's sort of complicated and like whether that worked or didn't work or how exactly that happened. Yeah. It's. I mean, that that story really isn't exactly told um, because yeah. the theory of the adventures is that you win, not that you, you lost. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I don't know. But the theory is, is he got enough followers to basically um, ascend. And uh, he killed enough other gods in some way, somehow, to carve out a... Pa- uh, a portfolio for himself, yeah. So he could call himself the god of secrets and whispers, and not be challenged by anybody. And there are various cults that have been ascribed to Vecna, and various yeah. again dragon issues and adventures and all that kind of stuff yeah. for a and, long time. Yeah, and some weird monsters have come out of it too. Like I remember, I think it was in Die Vecna Die. Some of his one of his key followers actually had a hand for a head, and another one Ooh. actually had a giant eyeball for a head. Oh, neat. It was weird. Yeah, um, really got b- banking on that. Like, that's what you know about yeah. Vecna, right? His hands and eyes. If, if, yeah, if you're fighting a monster as a giant hand or you're fighting a monster as a giant eye, you're starting to yeah. get the impression that maybe Vecna is on the horizon somewhere. Exactly. Um, well, I always liked the imagery of the of the hand, though, because it felt like the monkey's paw. Like, it felt like yeah, that story yeah, that, yeah, like, yeah, okay, here's a thing. Hand. Yeah, that looks like that. And then yeah. if you if you buy into it, you get great power, but at what a cost. It's right. always about, like, what you're you're giving up. So yeah. what what do characters give up? When they, when they, it's changed quite a bit over edition to edition. I think in in the DMG now we have a very specific set of powers that are kind of themed, and um, give the characters cool things if they have both and stuff like that. But even the idea that you got more power when you had both, I don't think was really nailed down in early editions. Um, I don't remember what the original first edition DMG write up was. In the original DMG, a lot of these artifacts they were described and then there were like blank spaces for the DM to fill in the artifact's power so it would right. always be custom to a given campaign setting. Right, right. So, yes. Which makes sense. So like the the DMG has like 10 level 1 powers, 5 level 2 powers, 2 level 3, you know, it's just... And, and there would be a list of powers you roll randomly on a table and it would do random stuff. Yeah. And so uh, that persisted for, for quite a while, I think. And then in third edition, um, I know there was a sort of point where we nailed it down. I'm not sure if we did nail it down more than that in second edition or not. Um, I don't think so. so. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's also interesting, too, like the idea of having 
two artifacts gives even more power. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a trope that's been used in a lot of MMOs, like having a set of things is more yeah. powerful, and that can yeah, really be that, traced back to this sense, idea. In that sense, this is one of the pioneers of the set mechanic, or yeah. the set idea. Yeah, right. And that if you if you're lucky and or unlucky enough to have both of them, you you know you get mm -hmm. more even more bang out of your buck. Yep. 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 Um, so so yeah so you get you get some powers but do you also get some drawbacks you get some flaws yeah there's usually something bad associated with it um, in the fifth edition version there are some drawbacks that come uh, when you attach these things and those are randomly determined okay so it's not like right so the character X, can't, so the player can't kind of meta game it in the beginning and say well if I slap this on I'm gonna get this negative thing he he or she won't know until it's slapped on I got it okay that's a good way to yeah. So have there always Supplies. be a cost that you can't just be mitigated by yeah. like I, I put you know uh, points right. in my dump stat to alleviate that. Yeah, yeah right. the, the fourth edition um, deluxe dungeon master's guide had a version that uh, a lot of the artifacts of the fourth edition uh, had. If you make me more pleased, I'll give you more powers. If you make me less pleased, I'll give you more negatives. And so, depending upon how you behaved, if you behaved like. Vecna would want you to behave, you'd get more powers. If you behave, you're paladin, you're driving right. a good guy with the hand of Vecna, and then you more negatives, and so. So it's kind of the idea of, of, of uh, alignment-based uh, things, yeah. know, right? So rather than restricting it, being like only evil people can put it on, it was right. like, well, if you behave in a certain way. Yeah. I like that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but when we were commissioning art for this thing in 5th edition, we actually got the hand wrong, and we had to flip it. Ah, uh, that might really? be yeah. the case. Well, that's funny. Hands yeah. are super hard in art, it turns out. <laughs> Whenever there's a hand, we usually get it wrong the first time. Like, I don't know why that's the case. It's just, just a yeah. rule. So I think I think the piece of art in the DMG is actually backward. Interesting. Yeah. Glad have Interesting note for you out there. Because I think it's supposed to be the right hand. I'm pretty sure, but I'm not positive. Well, that's I'll not have to look it up. Hand. Uh, so, what, do, do we know anything about uh, uh, Vecna and Kaz, what they were like before? Were they like a they normal... Were jerks. Were they They were just <laughs> they always were, evil. Oh, super evil. <laughs> super evil jerks. Super evil. Yeah, they were like conquer the world type um, uber villains. Okay. Um, yeah. Like they were, you know, Skeletor and his cronies. So in uh, in the in the Greyhawk uh, timeline, right? So it was yeah. more to do with... Was it Absolutely, had yeah. to do with the Ayus or any of those... Or is it kind of a did the circle of eight there, get there involved? There are some references to Ayus being sort of some sort of disciple of Vecna, or um, having been taught the secret of Lichtum. Lichtum uh, by Vecna, Vecna was his grade four teacher. Um, but <laughs> the connection there isn't super strong I mean, because Vecna comes uh, comes out and does his thing long before Ayus yeah. actually comes around. Right. Um, and uh, and Vecna basically is the leader of like this super powerful kingdom, empire, whatever you want to call it, and uh, attacks various places and so on. There, there's a, there's an, a, I think it might be in Die, Vecna, Die, but it might be one of the other adventures, Vecna Lives or, or something like that, where there's an accounting of Vecna's at assault on the town, city, question mark, of Fleeth. Uh, which, as far as I know, has no other references anywhere in the canon. <laughs> it, is, it is on Fleet. <laughs> Alas, poor Fleet. <laughs> it gone, just wiped from the face of the earth. Um, and That's such a uh, name. And it basically, is. Vecna like surrounds the town and is attacking it, and they they beg for forgiveness, and the leaders come out and say, "Hey, well, you know, and let's we'll surrender." And Vecna says, "No." And so they're like, "Okay, well, we'll we'll surrender our own lives." And the leader and Vecna says, "Well, mm, okay, maybe." And so then one of the leaders does so, or but like gets his family to surrender, but his family gets tortured to death in front of him, and then he tortures the, the leader to death, and then still doesn't let him go. Oh and God, then the like plot. it just it just gets more and more torturey basically Eesh. until there's like a heap of corpses of everyone in the entire town of Fleef. Afterward, I can picture Vecna standing there. Well, now we've conquered Fleet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Koss is beside him going, oh, bravo. <laughs> you did a good job with this well, one. That's, that's just, like, what a great day this was. And, 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 no, Koss is one of the ones who actually is torturing all these people. Yeah. It actually says so in the text. And yeah. so basically, Koss does all this torturing of all the, and beheading of all these people. And basically, there's a giant heap of heads in front of the leaders of this town. And, uh, and Koss, or, or Vecna basically says as sort of like a reward for their uh, is that he will protect them for the rest of their lives uh, that he ha they have the, his sort of protection for the rest of his lives the dead people the, the the leaders of the town oh that now that no were longer, not killed yeah that weren't killed now the town yeah. doesn't exist 
And so that's the kind of like guy Vecna is, Ugh. according to yeah, he's he's no no bueno, right? <laughs> and never was. <laughs> he, he was he was a bad seed from, yeah. from the get go, um, and he got these lieutenants with him who, who yeah. did everything. So. If you were going to, uh, so I, I imagine a lot of folks might be inspired to use Vecna or at least maybe these artifacts in their game. Yes. What kind of advice would you give uh, uh, to those folks? I would say roll it out gradually. Um, plan for it early on and then start dropping hints. If Vecna is either a powerful lich or the god of secrets, um, he didn't live this long by being kind of putting himself out there for just anybody to attack him or challenge him. So I think you've got to sort of drop little hints here and there or let little secrets slip until one day, you know, the characters discover they got to find this magic sword. And when they find it, it's like the sword of cost. And it's like, ah, got it. Now okay. I understand. Now we see how this is all fitting together. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting that these are two super powerful individuals who hate one another and they're both super evil. And so there's lots of fun sort of moral questions there about, you know, what do you do with basically two people who the two people who can take one another out are both super evil. And so how do you how do you act in that in that situation? Mm, you know, yeah. Do you do you take up the sort of cost or do you do you take up Vecna's hand and eye or, you know, having had somebody in the party take up the hand and eye? Do you go and get the sort of cost? Because that's the only well, but that's super evil, too. You know, and so that's right. kind of fun. Right. You know? Oh, that is fun. Now, do, would they do they have a falling out? Or did they always hate each other? Cuss. Yeah, they were they were chummy bummies for a while, and then yeah. uh, they had a falling out. It's, and, it's and a, somehow became more powerful because of it. It's a little uh, weird. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, like what set Koss off was he wanted to be sec. He, he was tired of being second command. Wanted yeah. to be first is oh. basically the main explanation. That's evil feeding on itself is kind of a theme yeah. here, um, and that actually is something the parties sometimes have to wrestle with too. If you put these artifacts in the hands of characters you'll probably see, start to see some self-destructive party behavior. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, imagine almost immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, so be careful is what you're saying yeah. by introducing these elements in your, into yeah. your campaign. But you can introduce them. Just be aware that the, the end game may not be what you imagined it was. It could all end in tears. <laughs> 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 and it most likely will. And now with all the, the adventure storylines, you know, there's the die, Vecna, die, and Vecna mm -hmm. lives. When are we going to have a, a, a Sarerak versus Vecna? Oh, Lordy. <laughs> Seems like the best, you know, Jason versus <laughs> Freddy type situation here with all these horror tropes that we're going yeah. with. When you say that, I'm like, well, even the best Jason versus Freddy movie is not a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be a really fun one shot that you'd run. Yeah, I, it's like, you know, what happens if uh, Superman fights? Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Um, Death. Lots of yeah. people dying all yeah. around. It's it's one of like the the Ravenloft setting um, basically swallowed up both uh, when Ravenloft was. Oh kind yeah, of we thing. should talk about that. Um, and so uh, there's Vecna Reborn, which is which is sort of a Ravenloft thing, I believe. Um, Ravenloft seems to swallow up all the baddies at some yeah, point. All the oh, okay. super baddies I didn't realize that. Get sucked into Ravenloft How at some yeah. point. How was that so, introduced? So Ravenloft as a setting was introduced as kind of like this world of you know the universal monsters almost you've got you've got the mummy kingdom you've got the vampire kingdom you've mm. got the werewolf kingdom etc and so it kind of became this world where the dark powers would come and suck up all the super evil or tragic weird evil people and give them a kingdom to rule mm -hmm. and one of the things about them having that kingdom is usually whenever they have that kingdom they don't actually have what they want so they're not happy in that place. And so Vecna and Kaas, being um, two people who are, aren't happy together, share a sort of realm together where they're kind of divided by a mountain wall, and they're continually at war, and they put their people sort of continually right. at war. And the Dark Power's like, excellent. This yeah. is what we wanted this whole time. Right. And I believe the, what's the realm called? Cavitius? Cavitius? Uh, That's Vecna's, Vecna's Something realm. Something like that. Within yeah. Ravenloft? Yeah, it's like a big... There's a big skull-like. Yeah, that's formation. that's certainly the that might be the, the sort of that might be a citadel, his citadel or something yeah. like that. And then the the place itself has a right. bigger name. But I if you're know. definitely using the horror, you know, tropes in your campaign, you're using Ravenloft yeah. as kind of inspiration. It makes sense to involve Vecna and Cause in some in mm -hmm. some way. Yep, that makes sense. Yep. and and um, just from a sort of an IP point of view, it's kind of cool because that means Vecna is no longer bound to a world, one world characters can come into Ravenloft from any world. Yeah. So anybody can face Vecna now. 
Um, and then he went off and became a god. <laughs> Of which plane is he? And just now we don't say, you know, it, because he's a more of a god figure in the current cosmology. He's less of a like a physical threat you're meant to fight. That doesn't mean he can't come up in the campaign. Matt Mercer just concluded a campaign featuring him, um, but even Matt, I think, uh, he that story. Uh, he gave the option of the players stopping Vecna's ascendancy to godhood. Mm. So Vecna was on his way right. and actually succeeded. And then they kind of cast his physical form away and spared the world his wrath. Um, but he's still... But he's still out there. Still might have power and come back. Right. Yes. It's, yeah, so like in, in fourth edition, Vecna was totally a god. In fifth edition, Vecna's a god. Um, because he's also one of the sort of dark powers warlocks can uh, connect with and oh. um, get spells from and stuff like that. Right, I forgot and that. So, um, you know, and it might be a case where Vecna's clearly a god in the world of Greyhawk and less so in other realms. Yeah. Like he has, he's sort of got one st- you know. one foot on godhood and the other one on sort of elder evil kind of, um, and he's sort of straddling oh. that fence. Right. So for your campaign, you can make him be either yes. or or yes. both. Yes, and I, we would encourage people to make him uh, whatever they want. Yeah, whatever fits. Yep. That makes sense. In Ravenloft, Citadel Capitus is uh, is Vecna's uh, abode and is basically a giant skull mountain. Yep. With a city. Of course it is. A city inside the giant skull. Yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought? That's why it's called Cavities. Cavity. It's got a cavity. Oh, yeah. The city it builds within yeah. the cavity. Yes. That makes I sense. I think there's still a city around it, too. And then, then you know, Cass has some realm on the other oh, side. That's that amazing. Looks, blah, blah, Cass. Yeah. Blah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. He's always going to be second fiddle. That's right. I didn't even know we were going to be talking about him today. I mean, we set him up as a vampire in mm-hmm. fourth edition. Yep, there, there, were, there was definitely a, so, an idea that he transformed into a vampire with um, the Ravenloft products, sort of transformed mm-hmm. him into a vampire and said, basically, he's, he got evil, and more yep. evilness made him a vampire. Like Strahd, kind of. And yeah, so, you know, sense. you have a vampire versus lich kind of scenario in, in Ravenloft. Right. right, and Strahd's got some, like, connections there, too, of being a warlord. Yeah, actually, kind Strahd's of. got a lich enemy as well, so maybe there is a thing there with yeah. vampires and liches. They just can't get along. <laughs> They should, you know, they're, yeah. they're on the same side. Why can't evil just get along? <laughs> well, hopefully, it's in, evil. hopefully in your campaign at home, uh, you'll be destroying all of these evil people we've been talking about In your today. campaign, Vecna might be a super nice guy. Yeah. He's like, can I just have my eye back? I can't <laughs> yeah. see. I have no depth perception anymore. <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> Trying to get to the early bird special. I'm all right. Tired of my friends calling me one eye. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be so the glitch. destroyer of worlds. That was my nickname in college. Yeah. It's really hard uh, to play guitar. How can people find out more about Vecna and or Dungeons Dragons lore, Mr. Chris Perkins? Why they can talk to me on Twitter, of course. Oh, uh, nice. My handle is Chris Perkins D N D. And what about you, Mr. Cernet? I'm also on Twitter at, at Cernet, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. Perfect. Uh, you can also talk to me. I'm at Greg Tito, but I won't be able to give you all this wonderful information except when I ask these guys. So, But I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, I think that's it for this lore you should know. We'll get back to the interview segments right about now with some bing bongs, and we'll see you next week. All right, so we have 12 minutes to do Dragonborn. You think we can do that in 12-ish minutes? We can try. We can yeah, try? We'll give it a shot. We can, get, we can do Dragonborn Part 1. Dragonborn Part 1. Ooh, I like that. Nice. All right, well, Will Jones, I think you're in the, in the, in the chat. We might be calling you a little bit late, but in that case, uh, let's get going with Dragonborns right about now. Right about now. Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. My name is Greg Tito, and this is the segment where I talk to Mr. Matt Cernet. Hello. And Chris Perkins. Howdy. About Dungeons and Dragons lore tidbits you can uh, use in the Forgotten Realms. Or... We're talking about Dragonborn. And today we're going to talk about Dragonborn. So, Some other than might them. be acquainted with a Dragonborn named Archon who just ran off with the hand of Vecna. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yes. In uh, Matt Mercer's Critical Role campaign. He is a, uh, uh, he's also in Force Gray. Right. So where did these Dragonborn come from? Well, <laughs> we had a funny little road to get here. <laughs> does it start with the Draconians? Are going to start there? It does not, actually. No. Oh. So, so Dragonborn starts in uh, third edition 3.5, actually. Uh, oh. And uh, I think it's Races of the Dragon that started out. And in that, Dragonborn weren't a race like you imagined them. No. 
uh, you would... They were a completely different draconic race. Yeah, you, you basically, this. if you were a, a worshiper of Bahamut and Bahamut liked you a lot and you liked Bahamut a lot, Bahamut would sort of reform you into a dragon person because he thought that was cool and you thought it was cool too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you would go into an egg, right? <laughs> yeah, and you, you'd kind of like come out a dragon person. Yeah. Yay. And you were dragon I'm born. A dragon person. I'm a dragon exactly. reborn. Yes. yes, makes perfect sense. They should have been called a dragon hatched, is all I'm saying. Dragon dragon hatched. <laughs> cuz they're not born, they're hatched. <laughs> so when 4th uh, edition was being formed, uh, we were looking at all the races and making decisions about what to include and uh, some folks thought it would be great if you could, since the game is called Dungeons and Dragons, actually play a dragon in some way, shape, or form. So they talked about the idea of bringing the Dragonborn forward, but then decided that the story may have been too restrictive, and so they kind of undid the buckles a little bit, loosened it up, and then it went through a process of development and redesign until it became a completely different thing. Mm. Totally, totally different. Yeah, and as happens when you get a number of people working on the same thing at the same time. Yeah. And, and so as, as fourth edition was sort of want to do, um, the Dragonborn then got kind of wedged into lots of different campaigns and worlds and so on as, as time went on. So right. um, there was some retro, you know, insertion into established canon to explain how these creatures just why they just didn't suddenly pop out of, up out of nowhere. Got yeah. It. And so in Forgotten Realms, that's that's the whole idea of uh, two worlds of beer and Toriel kind of passing through one another. That kind of explains part of the, the continent of beer, world of a beer, is left in the world and basically the area of what is Unther and the Forgotten Realms. And uh, it's now called Time Anther and there's Unther nearby, but whatever. Um, and those Dragonborn kind of then spread out from there uh, at that point. Yep. And the tale of their spreading out and their lands is covered in the Aaron's Aaron Evans novels, right, uh, which features a lot about Dragonborn culture, and actually Aaron developed a lot having to do with Dragonborn culture because she was probably the most, um, the author most intimately familiar with um, though that race, right? Yeah, we had her actually commissioned her to do sort of a document about it when we were doing fifth edition because one of the problems with um, the, the the fourth and the third was that. The art was very different, and then there, there's the whole issue of, well, there's a whole bunch of dragonborn that are female, and we depict them with breasts. breasts. And so <laughs> then it's like, what's going on here? Because we also say that they lay eggs. And then, and so, I mean, like, she um, went through and very logically sort of laid out all these different things that we should, we should do um, mm -hmm. with dragonborn and sort of how, how to kind of make things work. Um, you know, she, she toyed with the idea in that document of, about making them, um, what are they, what I think it's called monotremes, um, you know, like uh, uh, oh, uh, echidnas and platypuses, where yeah. they lay oh. eggs, but they also, um, the, the young take milk and so on. But then she was like, you know what, probably we just shouldn't have them to have so much cleavage, and <laughs> that will solve that problem. It makes there. a lot more yeah. sense. Yeah. And so, with fifth edition, the breasts went away. That's right. Um, yeah, and which makes sense, uh, especially yeah. if they're they're fighting and paladin. Actually, the only reason the breasts were on the dragonborn to begin with, and God, I was in the room when this decision was made, um, was because we were looking at art, and there was really no real differentiation between the male and the female. And when we were making miniatures at the time, mm. we felt like yeah. we needed to have some physical something visible. That differentiated them, and so boobs appeared on the female dragonborn minis. Yeah, right. I vaguely recall that because because it was like the the male and the female. The, there was a difference, a distinction in basically um, height a little bit and mm -hmm. sort of thickness of body a little bit. Right. But, but it when was you're at this nowhere, scale, yeah, it didn't matter. Yeah, and uh, you know one of the things that we thought about too with with fifth edition, I don't think necessarily is present in all the fifth edition art yet because it's this concept that came in late. Uh, I I maybe only a year or so ago now that. Um, is that the Dragonborn would be more distinguished by uh, sort of the the hair or whatever the, you want to call the it, frill the frill, the barbels and frills and so on. So I forget who's who. I think it's the females have the long hair mm -hmm. and the males have the weirdy beardy bits, but it might yeah. be the reverse. Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember that when that, that was made because that would seem like a, a good visual. Like, oh, that's that's how you can right. Distinguish, or you can just ask. You can just ask, <laughs> <laughs> or you know, they're probably used to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
uh, or not really worry about it at all and just <laughs> go about your adventures just as watch you and would see normally. what outhouse they go into. <laughs> <laughs> Do they even use outhouses? <laughs> Do Dragonborn poop? Yes. <laughs> but like, we're getting to the hard hitting questions yeah. here. You know, in in fourth edition and third edition, and leaking a bit into fifth, um, like they're all over the map for what their appearance looks like. I mean, they're 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 silver, they're brown, they're they've got barbels, they don't they. Um, they look more dragonborny than not. I was just looking through some of the older stuff where um, uh, for the launch of uh, fourth edition, and uh, it was there was um, some things about uh, Stacy Longstreet, who was the art director at the time, doing uh, sort of rounds of dragonborn and trying to say, okay, like, well, we've got this idea that we want dragons in the game and dragon people in the game. We want people to be able to play them. And we, so we played a lot with, you know, how human they should be or how dragony they should how be. How much expression yeah. should yeah. they have? And eventually right. it just ended up being, well, let's put a dragon head on top of it. Because <laughs> if you want to play a dragon person, you <laughs> don't really want to play yes. like like a weird lizard person from V or something like that. Yeah, yeah. you want right. it to be as human-y yeah. as possible. So, but as dragony as possible. Uh, so. the, the Dragonborn is a prominent figure on the cover of the 4th edition Player's Handbook. That mm, was is. an interesting decision because there were two covers commissioned for that book. Oh. And the one we went with had the Dragonborn most prominent. And that was because we felt, based on the feedback we were getting early on, that it would appeal to a younger set. Right, right. Um, and so we made a decision to put them front and center. Uh I can't say whether or not that was a great decision IP-wise. Probably not, because they're kind of a secondary race, um, second to the more conventional halfling, dwarf, elf, human combos. Yeah. And I think uh, we learned a lesson, though, from the Dragonborn um, in 4th edition, and that is to say that we can't neglect our core identity. And so with 5th edition, you'll see that you, in the player's handbook, you have the primary races up front, and then the Dragonborn and the Tiefling and the Gnome and the Half-Elf, the Half-Orc, are basically after them and treated as secondary options, which is to say some DMs may not allow them in their campaigns. Right, which makes sense. And and yeah. I think we can, in this segment, talk about more about, like, if you were to use them, what kind of ways, what are their uh, cultures, what, what are, you know... What analogs yeah. could you draw from them in your in your homebrew thing? So, like, what 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 defines other than their physical features? What defines Dragonborn as a culture? They have this idea of um, sort of coming from. Uh, well, they have they can have ties to dragons, um, and the dragon gods. They can stem from lost civilizations, lost empires, um, and sort of either trying to rekindle the glory days or find their place in a new world. Yeah. In the in the Forgotten Realms, having come from a beer, they are very anti dragon and so anti anti all dragons. Because on the sort of plain or, or uh, world of a beer, uh, dragons are a very sort of dominant species that rule over kingdoms and, and boss people around and oh, stuff okay. like that. And so right. they uh, the there is sort of a, a section uh basically the rebellious kingdom of Dragonborn in a beer got transported to the Forgotten Realms um, in the midst of, more or less in the midst of their rebellion. <laughs> so they're on like this weird war footing they're where like, they're about to attack some things. <laughs> and now we don't have to attack anymore, but that's all they know how to do yeah. in some ways. And, and so then they're out in this world and suddenly it's like, whoa, what the heck is this? And um, they know they have, you know, North Chacenta, which has a big ass dragon in it. It's yeah. Like, and, 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 war! <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they, um, they, I think the, the idea that, Took place over Aaron's novels, and um, that is present in the game now. Is that they're they are coming to understand, like, okay, you know, not all dragons are bad in this world. The metallic dragons seem to be pretty good. Bahamut seems like a pretty cool dude, you know. And mm -hmm. it was in a beer, they didn't really have anything that they would worship necessarily, like uh, they were because there were the primordials, not the gods, over there. Okay. And so now they're like, oh, okay, like paladins and clerics. This kind of seems cool, like you know. And so they're, they're sort of coming to grips with the world that they're in. Which is funny that you mentioned Paladins because we recently had some uh, uh, data released uh, by our friends at uh, Curse and making D&D &D Beyond of the characters that have been created in there. And one of the you know, uh, more common combinations of class and race was a Dragonborn Paladin. Uh, and I feel like that just kind of hits on the, 
the notes of what people kind of think about for for that race. Yeah. Like generally warlike, bit proud, bit devout, yeah, honorable, big, uh, big yeah. right? Yeah. And and a lot of our art from fourth edition definitely people who were fans of Dragonborn oh. saw you know Dragonborn as paladins a lot because it was taking after the third. It may have been the and, case that we had a really good Dragonborn mini early yeah, on. Yeah, that was a Dragonborn paladin. Figure. You're right, it was so as well as the cover. Just, you know, if they identify with the miniature, they sort of created a character to match, and so Dragonborn Paladins kind of took off. Yep. Yeah, and then even the cover, I think, that you mentioned is a yeah. paladin on the cover, so that right. might have yeah. been uh, an image that just is lost in people's minds for yep. that. That's interesting. Uh, so I, I like that. I like that as a as a as a you know uh, character culture of like you know they're they're generally warlike. They're generally uh, have like almost like a Klingon type of level of like. You they know. do have sort of. They seem to have an honor code, yeah, of one yeah. type or another. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's in Aaron's novels um, and some of the stuff that's been done in various source books and so on. It, there's an idea that their society is sort, of, sort of more meritocratic than most. Mm. Um, they have various clans and stuff like that that uh, that they um, ally to, but. Uh, that it's more about sort of go out and do things. And Anybody can yeah. can ascend in rank if right. they show the ability to do so. And you, know, you get step. your lazy ass off the couch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and there's an idea that, that like eating Cheetos. <laughs> get a job. <laughs> there's a sort of Klingonish sort of vibe of like challenging people who have the top spot, and 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 I'm not sure how that works if it's a meritocracy and it's about like you know. Who's the best weaver or something? But yeah. <laughs> you, know? you to weave off, <laughs> you know. But somehow that's that's yeah. sort of what how it's supposed to work, and, and that makes sense. So, uh, so if people were gonna uh, include them in their game. What uh, uh, what kind of a nation could they be? Or, or uh... they can be all sorts of things. When my fourth edition campaign, um, which was primarily a nautical campaign, took place in the middle of a dragonborn empire, mm. where dragonborn were among the dominant species. Uh, that was sort of tilting way over in the other direction and and putting a lot of narrative pressure on a race that had not received that kind of pressure before. Um, was that a successful? Did you feel like you... I, well, one one group survived and the other one didn't. So <laughs> I'm going to say I batted 500 on that one. <laughs> That's a 50-50. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, 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 there's a lot there. When you, when you scratch under the surface of Dragonborn, there's a lot to find underneath. They're not a superficial creation of the game and so because they've got these dimensions to them I think that DMs will find as they start to play with the race that they have a full range um, almost as much flexibility to do with Dragonborn what you can do with humans in the campaign world yeah and I think I think that um, you know when you link dragons to their clans or Dragonborn to their clans and then you think about well you know, how do they view dragons? Are they thought of as kin of dragons or not? How do dragons view them? Um, you know, I think previous versions of Dragonborn, there were was the idea that you would be a dragonborn of a particular color or a chromatic type, mm -hmm. um, and less so now. I think in fifth, it's yeah. more sort of like a, a pan dragonborn type. Right, you're not right. like a silver dragonborn. I mean, you still choose or, your breath weapon and your uh, resistance, which seems to hint at or tie right. to a dragon of a certain color, mm. and your scales may be colored accordingly, but... But we can, you know, a DM could play that up more or less depending on what they want to do with it, yeah. um, and certainly, you know, having dragons be a more important part of your world, if you want to do that, you can have them come out and be rulers of dragonborn kingdoms and stuff like that. That could yep. be really fun. Yep. Now, where it gets tricky is if you want to use them in Kryn. Yes. <laughs> and that, I, I joked about draconians as being the... It's like, the, what happens when dra when a draconian and a dragonborn meet? Yeah, they're like, hey, you... I, it's like that uh, Spider-Man <laughs> gif where it's like... Uh, uh, we're the same, but different. Yeah, so yeah, we'll, dra we'll cross that bridge. Dragonborn's just like, I was made the right way. <laughs> from an egg. Well, it's Wait. <laughs> Wait, well, we're all from eggs. Yeah. So the, the, there's draconians, there's dragonborns, there's half dragons. What else we got? We've, we know there's others that we have. Uh, Quarter dragons. Yeah. I, eighth yeah. dragons. I'm sure there are other things that we've done. Yes. Um, 
So, and, and they're all kind of occupying the sort of the same space. I remember there were discussions around fourth edition where like, let's just adopt draconians as our dragon people. Yes. And we were like, well, we can't do that because they're super evil and they turn people Their story people into, isn't, they're, <laughs> they have a very strong story and we don't want to dilute that. Yeah. yeah. And you, you don't want like the player character to be like, well, I got killed so my body turns to stone or I burst into acid. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the other drawback is draconians sort of go out badly. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who haven't read the Dragonlance now, Novels. <laughs> Go back and reread them. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, it's, it's worth it. Yeah. All right. Barnabas the Paladin just turned into a pile of acid. <laughs> <laughs> Roll up a new character. <laughs> uh, all right. Awesome. Well, that's definitely uh, uh, scratching the surface a little bit on the Dragonborn. It's up to uh, the Dungeon Masters out there to do even more so. But if uh, folks have questions, how can they get in touch with, uh, with you, Mr. Cernet? I am on Twitter at at Cern, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. And you, Mr. Perkins? Chris Perkins D-N-D is my Twitter handle. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and if we get a lot of more Dragonborn questions, maybe we'll do another Dragonborn segment. Yeah, you we'll were see. you were joking about part one, but I feel like yeah. we could do a part two. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. I, I figure like we got most of the key stuff out, though, pretty yeah. fast. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are getting good at this. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, guys. We'll be back with more uh, lore. And... We should do a lore you should know on humans. We should actually. <laughs> like, where do they come from? Do they come from an egg? I don't think so. I'm not sure I'm the expert, but <laughs> we're gonna have diagrams. Yeah, lots of miniatures. We'll make it happen. This is how humans make babies. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring we'll bring in the little bit, the little ones. We'll have uh, uh, Quinn, the and Xanathar. Noble. We'll explain it to everybody. <laughs> there we go. A lore you should know about humans from the Xanathar's perspective. <laughs> now that is something I would listen to yeah. and or watch. All, All right, right, let's end this. Let's do it. All right, we're done. Thank you, guys. Bong it up. Wait, that sounds different. (laughs) (laughs) Don't cut that. Don't cut that. Keep keep the bongs in there. Uh, All right, cool. Thank you, guys, uh, so much. Uh, Those of you folks on the Twitch, uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes. We're going to get Shelly in here. We're going to do our intro. I'm going to go through these announcements again, and then we're going to call up uh, Will and Sid uh, to talk about Encounter Roleplay. So it'll be coming very soon. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, We'll be back in a couple minutes.